So starting off with section 4.4, we're going to be combining fractions together. And what do we need in order to combine any fractions together? We have to have common denominators. Common denominators. And if we don't have common denominators, we need to make them common. But the first case that we're going to start with is if we do have common denominators, because it's the easiest. So I'm very visual, so I'm going to go ahead and draw myself a unit shape. I'm going to make it a square, and I'm going to divide it into four different pieces. And we're going to go ahead and draw that two times. We're going to pretend they're exactly the same. And if I'm going to go ahead and fill in two of these first units and one of the second, since they're divided up into the same number of pieces, if we're going to combine these together then, we're dealing with what? If we're going to add these two together, we're still going to create the same shape divided up into the same number of pieces, but now we're going to have how many shaded regions? So I've got two out of the four that are shaded in the first chunk, and I've got one extra out of the four in the second chunk. So in the third, I'm going to have one, two, three of them, three-fourths. So when they're divided up into the same number of pieces, we have the same denominator. We just add across the top. Two and another one will give us three. And it doesn't matter how many pieces it's divided up into. For example, we could take a circle and have that be our unit shape and divide it into six different pieces. So I've got two. Uh, we're going to pretend that that happened in the middle. Close enough. And again, we're going to repeat. Same shape divided into the same number of units if we're going to be combining them together. And in the first one, let's go ahead and shade in one, two, three, four of those regions. And then the next one, let's have one. But instead of combining them with addition, let's combine them with subtraction instead. So if I take my first shape, that shaded region, and I subtract off what's left, we're still going to create the same unit shape, divide it into the same number of pieces. But in this case, how many are we going to have? So I had one, two, three, four out of a total of six in this first shape. And I'm removing off one out of that uh, six pi. So we're, how many are we going to have left? I'm going to have one, two, three. They're not exactly equal, but pretend they're equal units. We'll have three, six. And we can reduce that down to what? If I've got three six of that shape, I've got the upper half out of the whole. So this reduces down to what? One half. So we're still going to be relying on previous information. We want to reduce down as far as we can go, but we're going to be combining these fractions together. So whether we're adding or subtracting fractions, what happens? We add across the top or subtract across the top. Subtract across the top. And then what happens? We keep the same denominator everywhere. Keep the same. So add or subtract, over, keep, as long as they match. So in the first few examples that we're going to run through, the denominators already match for us, so we just have to do the little bit of algebra across the top. So in the first example, we've got 2 sevenths and 3 sevenths. So combining that together, we just add across the top and keep the same denominator. So how many are we going to have? Five sevenths in total. We can't reduce it, so we're done with that guy. And looking at B, in this case, we've got variables down below, and that's fine as long as they match, and they do. So again, what happens? Keep the same denominator, add across the top. So we're going to have 10 over 16x, which we can reduce in this case because they both share what in common? 10 and 16 are both even. So we could take out a 2, so we could break up into 2 and 5 for 10, and 16 breaks up into 2 and 8. So again, we can reduce it down by a factor of 2, and we're left with what? We've got 5 over 8x. And we can see, top and bottom, that these two don't share anything in common, so we can't simplify any farther. 
Same story works, even if we're combining more than one fraction. As long as we have the same denominator, we just add across the top and keep the same denominator. So adding from left to right, 7 and 6 together gives us 13, plus another 3 is 16 in our numerator. And in the denominator, we've got 8. And that's going to produce a whole number. 8 goes into 16 two times. So in that case, we could reduce it down to a whole. And then the last two, just to practice the subtraction, same story. We've got the same denominator, so we subtract across the top. 8 minus 1, we get 7 ninths. They don't share anything in common. They're relatively primed to each other, so we're done. And then part E, last chunk, we got the same denominator. And we sub sub subtract across the top. 7 minus 5, what do we get? 2 over our common denominator of 8, which reduces down to what? 1 fourth. So 2 goes into 8 four times, and we have to have that placeholder of the 1 up top. So when we're dealing with a negative fraction, for example, if we start off with negative 12, 6. Yes, we could reduce it down to negative 2, but that's not the point. Whenever we have a negative fraction, we have two options for that negative. We can either give it to the top and put it on the 12. So negative 12 over 6 is still the same value. Or we could give it to the bottom. So we can make 12 positive and 6 negative. But we can't give it to both. Because if I put a negative on the 12 and a negative on the 6, a negative divided by a negative is a positive, and it's not the same result as what we started with. So whenever we're dealing with fractions and there is a negative, whichever is most helpful to us, we can use. We can either give it to the top, give it to the bottom, but not to both, because then we're changing the number altogether. So as we're working through these problems, whenever we have a negative on the fraction, we have to make the choice. Should I give it to the top or to the bottom? So in our first example, for us to have common denominators, they have to match exactly. So I can't have a negative 8 and a positive 8 and expect to combine them together. So we're going to go ahead and give the negative to the 11. And typically, this is what we're going to do anyway. Just give it to the top. And then, how do we handle it in this case? We've got matching denominators like we've seen before. Add or subtract across the top. Keep the same denominator. So between these two, which one holds more weight? The positive or the negative? The negative. And the difference between 11 and 6 is 5. So we've got negative 5 over 8. All right, same story down below. In this case, we have common denominators, and we have subtraction in the middle. So that subtraction sign is going to go with the 7. So as we subtract across the top and keep that same denominator, we're going to have 3x minus 7. And are these two like terms? No. So we're not allowed to combine them together. If we could, we would want to, but we can't. So we're done there. And then again, all the way across the bottom here, it works even if we've got more than two fractions being combined together. We have the same denominator, so we're going to keep that. And as we move across the top, what do we have? We've got 3 minus 6 minus another 3. All those negatives we're just going to give to the top. So as we work from left to right, 3 minus 6, which one holds more weight? The negative. Difference between those? Negative 3. So we're working from left to right. We've got negative 3 minus 3 all over 7. And then combining these two together, we have the same sign, so our answer is going to be more negative. And the sum of those two is 6. So we've got negative 6 over 7. How else could we report it? We could put the negative just out front. They all mean the same. All right. So now there's three for you to try. Pause the video, take a stab at them, and we'll come back and go through them all. And in part A, we have that common denominator, so we're going to keep that. And as we move across the top, what are we working with? I've got 10, negative 3, and negative 2 that we're combining together. So working from left to right, 10 minus 3, which one holds more weight, positive or negative? The positive. 10 minus 3 gives us 7, and we still have to subtract 2. 
So 7 minus 2 gives us 5 over 15, which we can reduce down to what? So 5 goes into 15 three times, and we have to have that placeholder up top. One third. We want to go all the way to the end, as far as we can go. Same story for B. We've got that common denominator already, which is nice. So we're just adding across the top. We've got 20, 6, and 7 all together. All of them are the same sign, so we're just looking for the sum of all of them. 20 and 6 together gives us 26. Plus another 7 is going to give us what? I've got 26 and 7. That'll give us 13, 33 over our common denominator of 11, which reduces down to what? How many times does 11 go into 33? Three times. Simplified. Done. And in the last one, part C, we've got our common denominator, so we'll keep that. And as we move across the top, what are we working with? We've got 2 minus 7x, and those two terms are not alike, so we can't combine them. It's as far as we can go. So next we're dealing with something that we've seen before, but now we have a new application with these fractions. We're evaluating an expression, so there's no equal sign, for these given values of x and y. So wherever we see our variable, we're going to put parentheses because it's not going to hurt anything. And what is my y value that I'm plugging in? Negative 8 over 10. And I'm subtracting my x value, which is negative 3 tenths. Okay, so we can get rid of the parentheses where they don't matter and kind of simplify it down. So on the first chunk of parentheses, did they actually matter? No, but again, it's not going to hurt anything if we have them on there. It's good practice, good habit to get into. And on the second case, do they matter? Yes, because we've got what? Minus a minus, which is really addition. So I've got negative 8 tenths, and we're adding on 3 tenths. So which one holds more weight between these two? The positive or the negative? The negative. And what's the difference between 8 and 3? We get... Five. So I've got negative 5 over our common denominator of 10, and that reduces down to what? Negative 1 half. So 5 goes into 10 two times, and we need that placeholder of the 1. And our answer is negative overall. So take this next one, evaluate the expression x plus y if x is equal to negative 10 twelfths and y is 5 twelfths. So what do we get? Again, put in parentheses because it's never going to hurt anything. And we'll decide later if we need them. So I've got my x value plus my y value. And on either of these, did the parentheses matter? No. So we're combining together negative 10 twelfths and 5 twelfths. We've got our common denominator. And we just add and combine across the top. All right, which one holds more weight between those two, the positive or the negative? The negative. And what's the difference between 10 and 5? Five? 5 all over 12, and can we reduce that? So 5 and 12, they don't share anything in common, so we're done. Okay. We can also have application problems with fractions. So in the next example, we want to find the perimeter of this shape that I'm going to draw. We're going to have a rectangle. And the length is going to be 4 fifteenths of an inch. And the width is going to be 2 fifteenths of an inch. So if we want to find the perimeter of this shape, what does it mean to be the perimeter of something? All the way along the outside, combining them all together. So our perimeter is going to be the sum of all the sides. So I've got 4 fifteenths of an inch for my length. And that happens two times, because this length is also 4 fifteenths of an inch. So we'll put two of those together. And then our widths, I've got 2 fifteenths for that side, and that means this side also has to be 2 fifteenths of an inch. And we won't worry about the units until the very end. So again, what in this case? We've got our common denominator of 15, and we're just adding across the top. So I've got 4, 4, 2 and 2 together. So working from left to right, let's simplify this. 
4 and 4 together gives me 8, and another 2 is 10, and another 2 is 12 over 15. And both of those share one in common, a 3. So we can reduce it down, or we can write out uh, the factorization to see what's going to cancel. So 12 we can break up into 4 and 3, and 15 we can break up into 5 and 3. So those 3's will cancel. They share that in common. So the perimeter of this shape is going to reduce down to what? 4 fifths. And what are our units in this case? One dimensional. So we're just dealing with 4 fifths of an inch. Perimeter all the way around our shape. All right, so the next application problem, we're probably going to want to draw a picture to really understand what's going on. So we've got the distance from home to the community center is 7 eighths of a mile, and from home to the post office is 3 eighths of a mile. How much farther is it from home to the fitness center than it is from home to the post office? So it's kind of hard to understand what's going on, so let's just draw a picture. So I've got, here's my house, here's home, and we've got two different locations. And which of those is farther away? The fitness center. So the fitness center is 7 eighths of a mile away from home, and it's a long distance. So I've got 7 eighths of a mile to get to the fitness center. And then the other place that we're traveling to was the post office, and it's only 3 eighths of a mile from home. So it could be in the same direction, it could be in the opposite, we don't really care. We just know that it's going to be a shorter distance than the 7 eighths of a mile because it's shorter. It's only 3 eighths of a mile to the post office. And what are they asking us to solve for? We want to figure out how much farther is it to go from home to the fitness center than it is to go from home to the post office. So if we want the difference between those, how do we handle it? So to figure out the distance farther, distance farther, let's kind of build a formula that we can throw our, our values into. Distance farther, how do we get there? So we're going to take our longer distance and subtract off the shorter distance. So if I take from home to the fitness center and remove off from home to the post office, it's going to give us this little piece that's left that'll tell, ma, tell us how much farther it is to go and pull from the post office to the fitness center in this case. So our longer distance was how long? From home to the fitness center, which was 7 eighths of a mile. And our shorter distance was from home to the post office, which was 3 eighths of a mile. So how much longer is it to go from here to here than it is from here to here? We've got our common denominators, so we'll keep that same denominator, and we'll subtract across the top. And which one holds more weight between those two, the positive or the negative? The positive value. 7 minus 3, what do we get? 7, 6, 5, 4, 8, which we can reduce down to what? 4 goes into 8 two times, and we need that placeholder up top. So, one half of what unit were we talking about? Mile. That's one half of a mile longer to go from where to where? Home to the fitness center. It's one half of a mile longer to go from home to the fitness center than from home to the post office. And how could we check that? How could we check to make sure that we've actually done this math correct? Before we reduced it, that extra length was worth how much? Four eighths of a mile. So wherever my post office is, up to that point, it was three eighths of a mile to get there. And then from that point, if I'm going to travel four eighths of a mile farther, then I should be at my total distance of what? Seven eighths of a mile, just like I drove to the fitness center. So we could check by combining together my first distance, three eighths of a mile, plus that extra four eighths longer, and that'll give us what? 
seven eighths of a mile, the total distance from home to the fitness center. So we've handled the cases where the denominators were already made the same for us, but when they're not, we have to make the common denominator. And we want to create as little work for ourselves as possible, so we're going to be shooting for finding the least common denominator. So any fractions, they could share a ton of different denominators in common. We're going to try to work with the smallest, so we're dealing with the smallest numbers possible. So I'm going to show you two different ways to do that, and we're going to be working with this first example. Combining together one-fourth and three-tenths. They aren't divided into the same number of pieces, so we can't combine them right now. And there's two different ways that we can handle it. One is not very mathematically mature. It does work, but uh, with larger numbers it's going to take a while, and it's just not very good to rely on the brute force method. So yes, it'll work for us, but it's not our preferred. So we'll use it in this example, but from then on, we're going to use our building method. So this one, we're going to like that one. We're going to use that one a lot. So brute force is going to work for us, and it does help us understand the process of what we're trying to do. So what are we trying to make common? Denominators between 4 and 10. So let's take them individually and write out all of their multiples until we find the least common multiple that happens to be in the denominator. That's why we call it the LCD, or the least common denominator. So I'm going to take 4, and I'm going to take 10, and we're going to write out their multiples until we hit a common one. Who knows when it's going to happen, though? That's the downfall of this method, the brute force. So 4 times 1 gives me 4. That's my first multiple. 4 times 2 is 8. 4 times 3, 12. 4 times 4, 16. 4 times 5, 20. We get 24, 28, 32, and it keeps going. So these are some of the first multiples. And we're going to do the same with 10. So 10 times 1, we get 10. 10 times 2, we get 20. 10 times 3, 30. 40, 50, you get the idea. So of all of these multiples, they're going to share a ton that are in common as this list continues on for forever. But what is the least common multiple that they share in common? So in my list of 4, I've got a 20. And in my list of 10, I've got a 20. Farther down the line, there still will be things that they share in common but the least common multiple between them is 20. So our least common multiple that happens to be in the denominator, that's a special M, is 20. So we can take 4 and turn it into 20, and 10 and turn it into 20, and we're dealing with the smallest number that's possible. But again, if I try to tell you, find the least common multiple between 320 and 730, Writing out those multiples until we get to a common one is not very practical. So what else could we do? Looking at this building method. How it works is we take both of those denominators and break them down into their primes. So we can't break down a prime any farther because the prime number, all of its multiples, are itself and one. So 4 is not prime, it's composed of two other numbers. We can break it up into what? 2 and 2, both of which are prime. So we know when to stop once we hit a prime, and I'm going to go ahead and circle every single prime that we hit, because I know that 4 is comprised of these two. We won't miss any if we physically circle them. We're going to do the same with 10. 10 is not prime, 10 can break up into what? 2, which is prime, and 5, which is also prime. So as we build our LCD, I want us to come back up to this process and just notice something. So our LCD or our LCM, they're interchangeable. That number is divisible by what? 20 is divisible by 4 because it was a multiple of 4. And 20 was also divisible by what? 10. So our LCM, or LCD, 
has to be divisible by both of those numbers, whatever we're starting with. So I know that inside of my LCD, I'm going to have to take all of the factors from 4 or all of the factors from 10. And it doesn't matter where we start. I'm just going to start with the one that came first. I know my LCD is divisible by 4, so it has to have what living inside of it? A factor of 2 and another factor of 2 because it needs to be divisible by 4. But it also has to be divisible by these factors. So this is where that building name comes from. We're going to ask, what is the LCD missing that this term has? So have we taken into account a factor of 2? Yes, we've already got two of them, so that one's covered. But I'm missing what up here that this one has a factor of 5. So we also have to multiply by a factor of 5. Then when we multiply all those together, what do you think we're going to get? Probably 20, but let's double check. So 2 times 2, we get 4. 4 times 5, we get 20. And just to show you that it works in the other uh, direction as well, if I had started with 10 instead, let's go down that route. So I'm rebuilding my LCD. Let's pretend like we don't know what it is. But my LCD has to be divisible by what? Both 4 and 10. And in the last case, we took this one first. So let's take 10 first, this case. 2 times 5. We need all of the factors of 10, because my LCD has to be divisible by 10. But what is this LCD missing that this other term has? I've taken into account one of those 2's but I'm missing another factor of 2. And the order doesn't matter with multiplication. When we multiply all those together, what are we going to get? 20 every single time. So 2 times 5, we get 10. 10 times 2, we get 20. So we can use those, those building skills, to get to the LCDs quicker without having to write out a bunch of multiples. So we're going to practice using this building method from now on. Yes, this one will work, but it's not very practical or mathematically mature. So we want to grow into building. So let's look at these three examples, and we've got a couple more after that. Let's start with those three. We want to find the LCDs of the pairs. We're not even trying to combine the fractions together right now. We just want to figure out what is the smallest common denominator. So 7 and 14 are what we're working with in the beginning. I'm going to take them off on the side. So we want to break these up into their primes, if we can. And what about 7? What are its factors? 7 and 1, so it's already prime. But 14 has what living inside of it? 2 and 7, both of which are prime, so we'll circle them. So our LCD has to be divisible by what? by 7, because that's one of the values that I have in my denominator. And it also has to be divisible by 14. So what is my LCD missing that this other factor has? A 2. So we have to take into account a factor of 2. So 7 times 2, what is our LCD? 14. Sometimes it works out that our least common denominator already is one of those that are present. And if we look through the multiples, like our brute force method in this example, it would take us about two seconds to find that. What are the multiples of 7? 7, seven 14. What are the multiples of 14? 14, 28. So that very first multiple is what they share in common. But it's not always going to work out like that, so let's keep practicing. What is the least common denominator between 12 and 20? So let's take each of those, break them into their primes, and let's start with 12. How do you want to break up 12 into a product of two things? We could start with 6 and 2. We could have 3 and 4. Both will get you down to the same primes. So I'm going to choose 3 and 4, because I can. 3 is prime, so we'll circle it. You can't do any more with that guy. But 4 breaks up into 2 and 2 both of which are prime. 
So we know we're done with 12. Let's move over to 20. What lives inside of 20? We could start with 10 and 2, 4 and 5. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to do 4 and 5. 4 times 5 gives us 20. 5 is prime. And 4 breaks up into 2 and 2. Both of which are prime. So we'll circle it. So as we start to build our LCD, it has to be divisible by what? 12 and 20. So it doesn't matter which one we start with. Take all of the factors of one of them. So I'm going to take 3, 2, and 2. It has to be divisible by 12. But it also has to be divisible by 20, so let's see what we're missing. So what is our LCD missing that 20 has? We've already taken into account two factors of 2. They live inside of our LCD. And what are we missing? Factor of 5. And the order doesn't matter with how we multiply, since it's the same operation everywhere. What is our least common denominator? between 12 and 20. So I'm going to combine these two together first because that's how my brain works. 5 times 2 gives us 10. 10 times 2 is 20. And 20 times 3 is 60. So the smallest common multiple shared between 12 and 20 is 60. We're going to keep practicing this skill because we're going to use it everywhere in algebra. So let's look at C. We want the least common denominator between 72 and 60. Now you can probably see the brute method is not going to work very well for us when we've got large numbers like this. But factoring it won't be so bad. So let's take 72. 72 we can break up into what? 9 times 8 is just one place we can start. And 9 is not prime. It can break up into 3 and 3, both of which are prime. And 8 we can keep breaking up into 4 and 2. 2 is prime, but 4 can keep breaking up into 2 and 2. So I know 72 has three, or excuse me, two factors of 3. So we can see that 72 has two factors of 3 and three factors of 2 living inside of it. Let's bump over to 60 and start breaking this one up. Doesn't matter where you start. I'm going to start with 6 and 10. 6 is not prime. It can break up into what? 3 and 2. 2 and 3. Order doesn't matter. Both of which are prime. And 10 will break up into 5 and 2 both of which are prime. So our LCD, as we build it, it has to be divisible by what? 72 and 60. So it doesn't matter which one we start with. Take all the terms of one of them. I'm going to start with 72. So I had a 3, a 3, a 2, a 2, and another 2. So we've taken into account all of these factors. But what is our LCD missing? that 60 has. So we've taken into account a 3, yes. Taken into account a 2, yes. We've taken into account another 2, yes. We're missing a factor of 5. Alright, so as we multiply all this together, the order does not matter, but what do you notice? So our very first number, all of those factors comprised together gave us what number? 72. So in reality, we're just taking 72 and multiplying it by 5. We just saw 72 broke up into all of its primes. So if I take 72 times 5, what are we going to get? What's our LCD? And you can't see that. Um, let's come over here. 72 times 5. So 5 times 2 gives us 10. Carry the 1. 7 times 5 is... 35 plus another 1, we get 36. So our LCD, 360. So the least common multiple between 72 and 60 is 360. So we could also be asked to find the least common denominator between more than just two fractions. And the concept is still the same. 
So in this first case, I need a number, an LCD, that's divisible by 15, 18, and 54. So they all have to have a common multiple, and we want the smallest one. So let's take each of those and break them down into their primes. 15 can be broken up into what? 5 times 3, both of which are prime. 18, doesn't matter where we start. I'm going to start with 9 and 2. 2 is prime, so we're done on that branch of the tree. But 9 can be broken up into 3 and 3, both of which are prime, so we know we're done. And then 54. How can we break that one up? A couple different options. We could do 9 times 6 to start, both of which are not prime, so we want to keep going. 9 breaks up into 3 and 3, both of which are prime, and 6 can break up into 3 and 2, both of which are prime. So our LCD has to be divisible by what? 15, 18, and 54. So I always just start from the left, but you could start with the biggest. It really does not matter. But let's start with 15. It has to be divisible by 15. So I need all of the factors in my LCD. But it also has to be divisible by 18. So what is our LCD missing that this factor has? So I've taken into account one 3, but I need another 3. And what else? A 2. So now we're divisible by 15 and 18, and let's check and see if we've missed any factors inside of 54. So what is our LCD missing that these factors have? We need another factor of 3. And the order doesn't matter with how we multiply. Working from left to right, let's multiply all these together. So 5 times 3 gives us 15. And we still have to multiply by all this stuff. 15 times 3 gives us what? 15 times 3, we've got 15, 45. 45 times 2 times 3 is what we have left, working from left to right. 45 times 2 gives us 90. And then 90 times 3 is what? Well, 9 times 3 is 27, so this will give us 270. That is our least common denominator between all of our denominators. And we can always check at the end. We can actually take the LCD and make sure that it's divisible by 15, 18, and 54. It require a little bit of work when we've got a large LCD like this, but we always have a check. So we haven't seen any cases where we have variables, so our last one in this case has some down there. So as we look at our denominators, our LCD has to be divisible by what? By x, by 5, and by x cubed. So what are the factors that are living inside of each of these? Can we break up x into anything? Nope. We could say it's prime or it can't be broken down any farther. Same story for 5. It's prime. But x cubed has what living inside of it? This is telling me x times x times x. Three factors of it all multiply together. So our LCD has to be divisible by what? Every single one of these. So I'm going to start with the first one. Has to be divisible by x, so I need to take that one into account. It also has to be divisible by 5. So I need to take that one into account. And what are we still missing that this third term has? Two more factors of x. And we want to write that with better notation. How else can we say it? I've got 5 times x to the third power. So whenever we see variables down below there, and they're all being multiplied together, we want to take the variable the greatest number of times that it ever shows up. So x to the third to the third was our highest power, and our LCD had x to the third in it. And let's run through that check, since these are smaller numbers. Is our LCD, this is kind of our check now, is our LCD divisible by this first term? Yes, because x 
One down below is going to cancel with one up top, and we'll get a whole value. So yes, it works for that one. 5x cubed, is it divisible by 5? Our second denominator term. Yes, we'll get a whole value. And then the last one to check is 5x cubed divisible by x cubed. Our last denominator, yes, we'll get 5. So we can always double check and make sure we've chosen the correct LCD. So there are three, two, just getting two for you to practice. Take those, find the LCD of those fractions. All right, so looking at our first case, the denominators that we're considering are 25 and 30. So we'll take each of those and break them down into their primes. 25 is composed of 5 times 5, both of which are prime. And 30, one option to start off with, is 3 times 10. 3 is prime, but 10 can still be broken up into 2 times 5, both of which are prime. So as we build our LCD, it has to be divisible by what? Both 25 and 30. Missed it. All right, so what are we going to have to take into account? I'm just going to start with 25. All of these are crap. Nobody throws out their markers. Missed that one, too. Maybe this one will work. A little better. Okay, so we've got two factors of 5, because that lives inside of 25. And what is our LCD missing that the factors of 30 have? So we need to take into account a 3 and a 2. So as we multiply all of those together, what are we working with? 5 times 5 times 3 times 2. So moving from left to right, 5 times 5, we've got 25. Still have to multiply by 3 and 2. So 25 times 3 gives us 75. And then 75 times 2 gives us what? So 2 times 5 will give us 10, carry the 1. 2 times 7 is 14, plus another 1, 15. 150. That is our least common denominator between 25 and 30. And let's move on to part B. Let's take each of our denominators and break them into their primes. So I've got 20, 24, and 45. Starting all the way on the left, 20 can break up into... 4 and 5, 5 is prime. 4 can break up into 2 and 2, both of which are prime. So we're done there. 24, we could break up into 6 times 4. 6 can break into 3 and 2. And 4 can break into 2 and 2. We hit all the primes. And the last one, 45, could break up into 9 times 5. 5 is prime, but 9 can keep going and both of which are prime at the end there. So let's build our LCD. It has to be divisible by what? 20, 24, and 45. Doesn't matter where we start, but take all the factors of one of them, and let's build what we're missing. So what is our LCD missing that 24 has? Another factor of 2 and a factor of 3. We've hit them all. But it also has to be divisible by 45, so let's see if we're missing anything. Our LCD is missing what from this term? Another factor of 3. We've taken into account the other 3, and we've taken into account the other 5. So when we multiply all of this together, what are we going to get? Let's do a little bit in our heads, and then the larger stuff will write down. So 2 times 2, we get 4. 4 times 5, we get 20. 20 times 2, we get 40. And we still have to multiply times 3 times 3. So 40 times 3 will give us what? 4 times 3 is 12, and we've got another factor of 10 limit in there. So 120. And 120 times 3 is going to give us 360. The least common multiple between 20, 24, and 45. So eventually we're going to use that skill to write equivalent fractions so that we can actually combine together fractions that don't have common denominators. 
So before we actually jump to that process, we're going to take this one baby step in between. So in each of these examples, we want to write an equivalent fraction with the given denominator. So what that means is, I want a fraction that means the same as two-fifths, but I want it now to have a denominator of 15 instead. And they have to be equivalent. So in order to turn 5 into 15, what do we have to multiply by? By 3. So whatever I do to the bottom, I also have to do then to the top. Because if I multiply the bottom by 3, I get 15. And if we multiply the top by 3, what do we produce? 3 times 2 is 6. So 2 fifths is equivalent to 6 fifteenths. We could reduce this one down and we get right back to where we started. And it's important to write this notation in this way. Because what is 3 divided by 3? So how many times does 3 go into 3? Just once. And when I multiply something by 1, it's not going to change. So if I've got 1 times 2 fifths, it's still going to give us 2 fifths. But if I write 1 in this funny form of the same thing divided by the same thing, it's just going to change what it looks like, but it still has the same meaning. So in part B, we want to take 11 and turn it into 44. So what do we have to multiply 11 by to get us there? By 4. And if I multiply the bottom by 4, I also have to multiply the top by 4. Because in reality, what am I multiplying by right now? 4 divided by 4 is just 1. We're changing what it looks like. So 9 times 4 gives us 36x over 44. Equivalent fraction that just looks differently now. Same story for C, but we have a whole number on the left. And if we've got a whole value and we want to see it in fraction form, we can always put it over what? 1. Because 3 divided by 1 is just 3. So now that we can see it in the fraction form, to turn 1 into 7, what do we have to multiply by? 7. And whatever I do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So let's double check, make sure we've done it correctly. 7 times 1 gives us 7. And then across the top, 7 times 3 gives us 21. Does 7 go really, really actually go into 21 three times? Yes. We can always check at the end. And the last one, to turn 3x into 24x. We already share the x's in common, so we're just focused on those constants. What times 3 gets us to 24? We have to multiply by 8. And whatever I do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So 8 times 3x, does it really give us 24x? Yes. And 8 times 8 is 64 across the top. 